So here's the thing. You and I know that there's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard, but do the Grammy voters know that? Do they know that there's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard? Well, only time will tell. Whether they know it or not, here's my argument for why I think Did You Know That There's a Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard deserves to win Album of the Year at the 2024 Grammys. Lana Del Rey is a formidable songwriter who has gone criminally unrecognized by the Recording Academy, most egregiously losing Album of the Year for her seminal work, Norman Fucking Rockwell, in 2020. Definitely the year of a curse, for sure. This is partly because Lana has always been a little bit ahead of her time. She's an artist that is a little bit too in tune with what goes on in popular culture and within her own psyche. And to truly meet the moment, you kind of need to be a little bit regressive. But it's also because Lana doesn't really give a you-know-what. You know, you just don't negotiate when it comes to your work. You just stand totally firm and take the consequences. In terms of losing fans, I don't care. Period. It's not just that the Recording Academy doesn't get her, it's that she doesn't really always put herself in a position to get got by the industry. I'll explain more on this and why my Lana hasn't won a Grammy yet section of this video. Today, we're going to be talking about Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, her sprawling, dense, and incredible ninth studio album, which is nominated for multiple awards at this year's Grammys, including Album of the Year. So this is Grammy Month on Swiftologist, where I plead my case to my four favorite albums that are nominated for Album of the Year this year and tell you why I think they deserve to win. I think that this category is so stacked. It's super exciting. Last week's video was about Olivia Rodrigo's incredible sophomore album, Guts. And today I'm talking about, you know, my favorite, my girl, Lana Del Rey. You know, I'm the Lanaologist. I've been on a hiatus for a while, but I'm back. I was, you know, a little bit daunted by doing the tunnel video because it's such a dense record to explore, but I put pen to paper and I am here to give you my screed. If you're new here, my name is Zach. I'm the Swiftologist and I make thoughtful weekly videos about pop culture. If you like deep analytical dives into different kinds of music and the other forces that animate our discourse, on popular culture, then make sure to subscribe because I know that over half of you that watch my videos are not subscribed and that makes me sad. So please rectify that by subscribing. Before I get into my breakdown of Tunnel and Lana's unique struggle with trying to win a Grammy, I'm going to go through what makes an album of the year and how the Grammy voters even decide this accolade in the first place. If you're not interested in that, I will leave a timestamp here and you can skip all the way ahead to my Lana analysis. Do I really think that Tunnel deserves entirely album of the year for Lana Del Rey compared to the other records she's put out and perhaps even been nominated for? Let's get into it and find out. My overarching feeling is yes and also maybe no. This year is the most stacked category for album of the year that I've seen in a long time. It's overwhelmingly female, Slay, which we love to see, and full of pivotal records for each and every artist. One year to note that was similarly stacked in this way that was full of female artists was 2010. We had The Fame by Lady Gaga, Fearless by Taylor Swift, and I Am Sasha Ferris by Beyonce. This specific award has always received a lot of criticism and attention. That's partly because it's the most prestigious accolade of the night, and it's a highly sought after achievement, and it's often a curveball thrown by the Academy members who seem to be increasingly out of touch with what the public actually considers to be the album of the year themselves, but this isn't an award show that's really intended to reflect what the public likes. It's not a fan voted ceremony. It's supposed to award artists based on their artistic excellence, which is defined kind of vaguely by a number of different things from showmanship to musicality, songwriting and commercial appeal. All of these things are taken into consideration when Grammy voters are evaluating who should be nominated for any award really. But most importantly, the Grammys are trying to celebrate the blending of mass appeal with artistic innovation, and that's what tends to get awarded most in Album of the Year especially. This is why we're really happy when albums like Folklore win, and why we're confused when albums from Beck or John Batiste win, because the commercial appeal doesn't always match up with what the Grammys have decided is the artistic appeal of a record. Let me quickly explain what some of the issues have been with Album of the Year and Grammy nominations in general over the years. Top 40 artists are overwhelmingly favored, even though the Grammys purport to celebrate artistic excellence. What's popular is not always what's excellent, and excellence doesn't always line up with commerciality. Plenty of mass influential artists like Diana Ross, Jimi Hendrix, and Bob Marley were never awarded this honor. Lana Del Rey similarly has not been successful in achieving a Grammy despite the fact that she has had a wide, maybe not directly commercially measurable influence on pop culture. The behind the scenes process of nominations and voting is extremely opaque. Every year there is a fresh wave of criticism as to the lack of diversity or the out of touchness of the nominations and eventual wins. And this is usually because of the secret screening committees, which were done away with, I think, a year or two ago. But it used to have a final say of the nominees from a short list of about 30 different artists. And allegedly, some members of those screening committees had 
ulterior motives. You know, keep in mind that the people who are voting for these awards are all industry people. This is like insider baseball. The people that are voting want to maybe support their artists. Perhaps you're a record label exec and you're invested in the idea of your artist winning album of the year. The out of touchness of the voters also extends to the representation and the diversity that we see in the nominations. Up until very recently, it was difficult for non-white artists that weren't Beyonce and even sometimes still hard for Beyonce to get nominated in the main big four categories. They're often relegated to genre categories, which are completely out of touch with the zeitgeist. For example, why are we separating big R&B and hip hop and international music moments away from the general pop categories? From Latin to K-pop, we've seen these other influences continue to explode in popular music as of late. There is also that political element to the Grammys as well. Labels can only throw so much support behind each of their artists, leading them to invest more heavily in the artists that they think have a chance at succeeding or actually winning the nomination more. So it becomes less about like who deserves it and more about who is most likely to win. Does that sound like a process that only awards artistic excellence to you? Not to me. Let's get into Lana Del Rey's kind of spotty history with the Grammys, shall we? Lana is always in kind of a strange spot with the Grammys because of the artistic and commercial overlap. Her records and tours sell like a pop girl, but she's not a traditional album cycle girly with first, second hit singles that have easy to understand extensive marketing campaigns or big budget music videos. Of course, she indulges in these things from time to time when she feels like it's appropriate, but Lana kind of has an, I don't really take this seriously approach to the Grammys and the Grammy voters really do prefer artists that kiss the ring and constantly talk about what an honor it is to be nominated. Lana has been super removed from the Grammy nomination process, which usually involves, as I mentioned, a lot of campaigning and lobbying by the label and by the artists themselves. And this is just not Lana's style, <laughs> even up until this year, where I think she said somewhere that she didn't even know that her label had to submit X, Y, or Z song, record, or whatever it is to get nominated. I, in fact, only learned this year that you have to submit your own album <laughs> if you want to be nominated. So... Uh, even that was like out of my wheelhouse. I mean, she showed up to the Grammys where she was nominated for Album of the Year in a dress from the mall. That kind of tells you how seriously she takes it. I am wearing, um, we actually just, we just got it from the mall. So. She's certainly an artist that is more focused on the art and the creative process rather than really chasing acclaim, critical or otherwise for her work. She kind of keeps her head down and just gets it done. And this is what makes her such a wonderful and exciting artist to follow. But I also think it may be what holds her back from getting the recognition she deserves in the industry and critically in general. We all know that it took a while for the industry to actually admit that Lana was talented. Shockingly, her first nomination came for Paradise in Pop Vocal Album and Young and Beautiful for Visual Media. In, in this early part, of her career, I think it was 2013 or 2014, she was notably left out of the songwriter categories and the big four nominations. And this again shows how out of touch the Grammys are with what music is actually driving culture. Born to Die was the fourth best selling album in 2012. Why the hell wasn't it nominated for album of the year in 2013? Can anybody tell me why? I don't know. It smells like misogyny. It smells like Lana Del Rey anti-bias. There wasn't even a single female nomination that year. Call Me Maybe gets nominated for Song of the Year, but video games is paid dust. Why wasn't she at least nominated for Best New Artist in 2013? The category wasn't exactly stacked outside of Frank Ocean, who should have won. Fun actually took home the award for Album of the Year this year, which is crazy in hindsight. And kind of funny how it full circle comes right back around to Jack Antonoff with Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard and Norman Rockwell, the two albums that have been nominated for Album of the Year. Nothing for Ultraviolence or Honeymoon, Pop Vocal for Lust for Life, and two nominations for Norman Rockwell, Album of the Year, and Song of the Year. Billie Eilish won over Norman Rockwell for Album of the Year. Are you serious? <laughs> Thank God Lana showed up in a dress from the mall that year because they were not worthy or deserving of her attendance and her attention. Chemtrails and Blue Bannisters also got nothing, but Lana also gave those albums nothing from a promo perspective. She literally kind of just like dropped them and kept on going. So I can kind of get it, I guess. Tunnel, however, her widely acclaimed ninth studio album is nominated in five categories this year. Album of the Year, Best Alternative Record, American Horror for Song and Alternative Performance, and Candy Necklace for Best Pop Duo. That's an interesting place to put Candy Necklace. I mean, I personally would have put Let the Light in there, but John Batiste is a Grammy darling, so maybe they'll win. She'll probably get American Horror for Song and Best Alternative Album. I'm not sure how she'll fare in Album of the Year, but if she won, I certainly would be clapping and cheering. First of all, it's long overdue, but second of all, it makes sense from a craft and culture perspective. In case you didn't get to catch my Guts video, I like to examine these records from my perspective with three different categories, artistic excellence, cultural impact, and legacy. So artistic excellence is all about how has the artist challenged themselves? How did the process of making this record advance their artistry? 
Is there anything really unique and different in this record cycle that they hadn't done before? What kind of boundaries were they pushing? What was going on in the genre, like writ large at the time? Then I look at cultural impact. So how successful were the singles? Commerciality definitely plays an important part of this. Not 100%. I'm not a chart obsessed person. And that also is always the least relevant thing for Lana Del Rey, because she continues to be endlessly relevant despite not charting or selling in a very specific pop girl kind of way. And then I look at the legacy. So how will this album be remembered? This one is a little bit more up in the air of a category because it's hard to tell when these albums are all fairly new. But I think I did get a pretty good read on Tunnel, which I hope that you will agree with. So let's start with my favorite category and what is going to be the bulk of this video, because this is always how I'm thinking about Lana Del Rey, artistic excellence. Lana's artistry truly speaks for itself. She is known as the best current American songwriter, period, for a reason, and it's not even really close. Tunnel is an audacious, sprawling monster of an album that touches on, well, everything. Life in general. It's an esoteric missive on death, grief, legacy, memory, love, and loss. It's perhaps her most expensive and adventurous record yet, with an eclectic and diverse sonic palette and numerous collaborators. And the record only works because it's tied together by the core skill of this brilliant artist's career, prolific and literary songwriting. In a certain sense, you could say that Lana's whole career has been building up to an album like Tunnel. It has moments of beautiful and descriptive startling clarity, just like we saw on NFR, but it also has the sultry swagger of Born to Die and the rambling sometimes beautifully incoherent runaway thoughts of chemtrails and blue banisters. It's an amalgamation of all her greatest skills. It also introduced something new as well, these deeply personal snippets of who the artist is as a person beyond the persona. Shockingly, Lana is actually not a very confessional songwriter. She leaves very specific details up to the imagination. You kind of get to insert yourself into her perspective when you listen to her work. So to get something more personal in Tunnel was very interesting. For a long time, the Lana Del Rey performance acted as somewhat of a shield for an extremely energetically sensitive woman. I've always said for years that Lana is just not well suited for fame. She has very capricious mood swings and seems to not always be able to handle criticism, even when it's coming from a constructive place. But this is what it looks like, Tunnel, I mean, when an artist has fully come into themselves and has been allowed to call all the shots creatively. Lana wouldn't be where she is without all the pushback that she had, so there's something beautiful to be found in the resistance and resilience she had to build in the face of it. So let's talk about the sound. Before we talk about the lyrics, I do want to talk about the instrumentation and the sonic landscape of this record. Whereas Lana's prior record were more focused on world making. Honeymoon is a really good example of this. Tunnel is kind of formless. In fact, its thesis is kind of that it doesn't have a thesis. It reflects all the chaos and the discourse of an ordinary life, the highs, the lows, and all the nonsense in between. Many of these songs crash in at over six minutes long with various quirks added onto them throughout. The outtakes of her backup singers on the album opener, The Grants, a random interlude from Pastor Judah Smith, the interpolation of a Tommy Genesis song for no particular thematic reason, and even concluding with a callback to one of the highlights of what many would consider to be her best album yet with Taco Truck and Venice Bitch closing the record. This record is both deeply profound and seriously playful. We hear her vape crackling throughout, Lana muttering to herself in the vocal booth, and her lyrics occasionally devolving into utter nonsense on the show-stopping album highlight American Horror. There is a real sense of experimentation here, and that's a huge part of artistic excellence, creating something new or going somewhere you haven't gone before as an artist. The production contributions here really add to the experimental, fun feeling of what's going on. Lana, like many pop girls, has worked closely with Jack Antonoff through the years, but I would argue the most beautiful soaring arrangements on this record were contributed by other semi-regular characters. Drew Erickson was a really significant collaborator here, playing the most gorgeous piano string and organ arrangements on the grants and tunnel. Lana said she wanted this record to have a spiritual vibe, and to me, these songs are the closest to a divine worship or a gospel moment. He also wrote on and produced Sweet, which has slowly become one of my favorite Lana songs. It's a gorgeous devotional ballad about being sure of yourself and knowing what you have to offer someone and being able to fill yourself up with love as well. Drew Erickson crucially produced and wrote on the first song created for this record, what some might consider its emotional center, Fingertips. This must have been a tricky one to produce as it was Lana's first brush with what she called automatic songwriting. I'll get into that later on when we discuss the lyricism. We also have Lana's ex-boyfriend, Mike Hermosa, appearing for the first time to offer production and songwriting on some of these pivotal tracks as well. He wrote on The Grants, Tunnel, Let the Light In, Peppers, and Taco Drop. Zach Dawes also returns, forming the trifecta with Hermosa and Erickson on The Grants and Tunnel. He also produced another show stopper, Candy Necklace. And I really appreciate how he centered Lana's vocals here and helped John Batiste bring out that beautiful asynchronous piano arrangement to really shine. His work with Lana always brings out something new and shocking in her vocal delivery. The caterwauling dealer, the fingertips-esque mumbo jumbo of black bathing suit, and the sensual, casual, semi-desperate and disinterested pleas on California. And of course, we have our beloved Jack Antonoff doing what he does best, helping Lana translate some of her more idiosyncratic ideas into more digestible pop-oriented alternative 
of songs. His work is most astonishing on American Horror. The way that instrumental falls apart and comes back together is truly incredible. We go from a dirty, urgent acoustic guitar to the long lost Lana Del Rey trap beat that fans have been begging for for years. And Lana has been coy and mysterious about providing. This song was recorded over a period of two days with two distinct sections, American Horror and Jimmy. Jimmy is kind of an ethereal, ghostly stand-in for a man in many contexts throughout Lana's work. It's a cool reference to bring his figure back on a song like American Horror, which is so quintessentially Lana in a very ultra-violence way. It also samples the title track of Norman fucking Rockwell, and it's interesting how deliberately or not deliberately NFR and Tunnel are linked by the production choices made on these records. I can definitely see them as two very separate accomplishments of Lana's greatest strength. Her wisdom and her clarity on NFR and her weirdness and her adventurous spirit on Tunnel. All of these contributions amount to the strangest pop album in recent memory. It's alternative. It's Americana. It's gospel. It's trap, folk, soul, and psychedelic. It could very easily have become a completely nonsensical mess, but again, it's all tied together by Lana's commitment to her vision of spiritual songwriting. That was something she was very committed to here. Lana's vocal development throughout her career is a really important and crucial part of her artistic excellence journey. In my opinion, she's always been a beautiful singer, but I think starting on Honeymoon and extending onwards, she's gotten really brave with her voice and she understands her range and the limits of her voice a lot more. Her vocal deliveries in the earlier stages of her career fell more into these talk singing, mumblecore, sad girl wave kind of a dribbling almost. And it really worked for the persona that she was building at the time. But I feel that as of late, she's really unlocked her vocal power and let her songwriting wander in tandem because her voice has soared through new falsettos and dimensions. There are so many songs on this record in particular where her vocal delivery can turn what might just be an otherwise ordinary Lana Del Rey track into something completely transcendent. Her dynamics and breath control on Candy Necklace and Paris, Texas are two highlights that really display this. I remember hearing Candy Necklace in Hyde Park when I saw her live over this summer and everyone around me just went totally silent. For a performer who has historically dealt with not a small amount of stage fright and has been criticized relentlessly for giving non-perfect vocal performances, where Lana is now with her instrument is a testament to her belief in her ability and also just to her talent in general. How she manages to vape like a truck driver and squeak the way she does in songs like White Dress, I don't know but it works. Now let's talk about the songwriting and this is gonna form the bulk of the video. Let me start with the title track because it's the first thing we heard from this record and in my opinion, the centerpiece and album highlight, maybe one of my favorite, not just Lana songs, but general songs of all time. I knew when I heard that deep breath that it was over for me. One breath and I'm gagged. That deep breath at the beginning of the song sent me into the grave. This song is the epitome of Lana's prowess as a songwriter and a performer. She is a transportive artist, and I really felt this beautiful, melancholic, yet still quite hopeful ache in this song. Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, the title track, introduces what I believe is kind of the heart of this record, spiritualism. Lana is thinking about God and the legacy she wants to leave behind, her family, grace, moving on, forgiveness. There's a certain peace to be had that Lana has definitely found on this song. It's as if the pain of being a profoundly misunderstood artist has been taken in stride. It's not like it doesn't hurt for her to be misunderstood anymore, but there's something beautiful beyond it. A quiet resolve and a belief in herself that everything is going to be just fine. I feel this most acutely in the searching howl. When's it going to be my turn? Followed by the plea, don't forget me. There's a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard. This is kind of a dense Lana song, as much of this record is, and it really requires you to be a bit clued into the Lana lore to truly understand what she's singing about. What I love, however, about Lana and this record in general is that you you don't really need to get all the lore and the references to feel this song. Its complexity and quirkiness actually makes it very intuitive to understand. This feeling of being misunderstood is represented so beautifully in the analogy of the tunnel under Ocean Boulevard, which is a gorgeous mosaic hand-painted pedestrian passageway in Long Beach, California that was closed to the public in 1967. It's such a Lana Del Rey thing to do to find this obscure gorgeousness that people don't know about and compare herself and the struggle she's had with coming to terms with her artistry to it. I love this line that explains her connection to it. I can't help but feel somewhat like my body marred my soul, handmade beauty sealed up by two man-made walls. She's wild at heart, okay? She contains multitude. The human form simply does not do the mind of Lana Del Rey justice. Sweet is another album highlight for me. It also depicts this yearning, searching character, wondering how her thirst for the ephemeral, the spiritual, the otherworldly can be matched by a partner. There is for sure a divine femininity in this song, and Lana is so in tune with her femininity that she really feels no need to explain herself really or compare herself to others. We hear this very clearly in the line, what you don't really understand is I've got magic in my hands and stars in my eyes. If you want some basic bitch, go to the Beverly Center. 
it's not a lot of record without a little bit of pick me energy. So, you know, we're happy to see that again on Sweet. We see the searching disposition again in the second verse of Sweet. What are you doing with your life? Do you think about it? Do you contemplate where we came from? Do you want children? Do you want to marry me? Do you want to run marathons in Long Beach by the sea? I've got things to do like nothing at all, and I want to do them with you. Do you want to do them with me? That last line, I think, shows a profound but tremendous growth in our narrator. For a long time, she sought love in the wrong places or unhealthy places. She was covetous at times, self-destructive, unsure of herself, but now she knows that love and partnership is time spent doing nothing at all, just being together. Do you want to do nothing with me is now her most important question. This album lyrically is more insular than outwardly analytical, and it's been some time since Lana has done a vibe check on the culture. The last time I remember her doing this was on Chemtrails. However, there is this stunning American Horror that provides a commentary on our word culture in America and Lana's tempestuous relationship with fame, the media, and her very own self-worth. This is a defiant song. It's certainly about a loss of innocence. I haven't done a cartwheel since I was nine. I haven't seen my mother in a long, long time. She addresses the various ways in which her appearance has been picked apart and mocked over the years. It's certainly interesting how she went from a bit of a sex pot, sad girl icon a la Marilyn Monroe to an almost reviled figure of failed femininity with this ridicule that was directed at her, notably by Azalea Banks when she was pictured during the pandemic at a gas station. Lana asks the listener, do you really think I give a damn what they say about that? She expands on this more saying, I'm a princess. I'm divisive. Ask me why, why I'm like this. Maybe I'm just kind of like this. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm just like this. This is a really affecting part of the song for me. I think it's such a good description of her tension with the media. Lana doesn't really like to explain herself. She's difficult to pin down. She has capricious mood swings. You could ask her a question on one day and get a completely different answer to the same question the next day. And that's part of what makes her so exciting as an artist, but also what makes her so difficult to parse by the public. She doesn't really conform to our ideas of what a pop star should be. And she is certainly the most atypical left field superstar that we have. She she goes on to say, if I told you that I was R-worded, do you really think nobody would think I didn't ask for this? I won't testify. I already effed up my story. There's a deeply compelling thread here about victimhood and what the perfect victim of SA should look like and how they should behave. Lana knows that her personal history, documented through song, would lead an already victim-shaming culture to come to an immediate conclusion about whether she was telling the truth or not. She then talks about being the other woman, the side piece, a second priority. This is something we've heard from her before, how she's kind of addicted to this drug of nothingness, of becoming and feeling invisible. That's a lot of ground to cover in just one song. And the production elements offer a very suitable whiplash for the listener. The most convoluted song on this album, lyrically dense and almost beat poetry-like in the sense that they're just unfiltered thoughts, are Fingertips and Kintsugi. The former is a Rubik's Cube. <laughs> Lana's generally not very confessional as a songwriter, but this song is definitely the most revealing one we've ever had from her, I would think. She called the process of making this meditative, automatic songwriting in an interview with W Magazine. It's where I don't filter anything, she says. I'll just sing whatever comes comes to my mind into the notes app on my phone. For the first song, I pressed record and sang When I Look Back, tracing fingertips over plastic bags. I think I wish I could extrapolate some small intention or maybe get your attention for a minute or two. She's dealing with a lot of existential questions here on this song, reckoning with the mortality of her family members, fretting over her feelings towards motherhood. She talks about taking psychiatric medications and her family's history of mental illness, wanting to be buried with her family in a mausoleum, learning of the death of a family member across the world before having to perform. We also get a little bit more information on her tense relationship with her mother, who seemed to suggest that Lana belonged in an institution, she makes the kind of statement that can only come from a profoundly hurt little girl. Exotic places and people don't take the place of being your child. I give myself two seconds to cry. Then we have Kintsugi here, which I don't want to get too much into because it is very emotionally resonant for me, but this song is about grappling with the death of your loved ones and finding the way to see the beauty and the normalcy in the passage of life, being surrounded by love and your grief. It's just that I don't trust myself with my heart, she says. I had to let it break a little more because that's say what it's for that's how the light gets in part of what makes tunnel what it is is the diverse eclecticism not everything is new per se we do have some classic lana del rey fair on this record may i point you in the direction of paris texas this really reminds me of bel-air from paradise in that it has this spooky southern gothic edge to it lana is an excellent vibe creator and this really is her wheelhouse she's name checking paris texas and florence alabama here this is very quintessentially lana to me paris and florence immediately conjure this 
sort of cosmopolitan glamorous image. But the places that Lana's actually listing here are places that no one has heard of and where nothing particularly happens that can possibly compete with the weight of their namesake in Europe, right? For her to be interested in these kind of bargain basement versions of these places rather than their namesake is very Lana Del Rey of her. She is an American songwriter after all. Her own country in all of its quirks is her ultimate muse. One of the most beautiful parts of the writing on this record is Lana writing about loving her family, which is really in tandem with the spiritual journey she's a parked upon. Grandfather, please stand on the shoulders of my father, etc, etc, is an album highlight for me. It kind of blends American horror with the grants. She's talking about how the public has a wrong perception of her as an industry plant or as someone fake, and she contrasts this by showing her lineage. She, her father, and everyone else in her family stand on each other's shoulders, protecting their legacy and making their love known to each other. She asks God to send her signs, and then she asks her grandfather too. She says, I have good intentions, even if I'm one of the last ones. If you don't believe me, my poetry or my melodies, feel it in your bones. Then we have some good old-fashioned Lana Del Rey love songs in Let the Light In and Margaret. This shell peppers and taco truck make up the sillier and lighthearted parts of this record while still addressing the probing questions about Lana's place in the culture that she's addressed elsewhere. Personally, I love Fishtail. Don't you dare say that you'll braid my hair if you don't really care. You wanted me sadder, Fishtail. What's the matter with you? This idea of people wanting her to perform the sad girl character for them. I'm not that smart, but I've got things to say, she says. Such a beautiful line. And we have her calling her herself Lanita and sitting upskirt on Peppers and Taco Truck. It's a kiki. It would have been so easy for Lana to write a very serious album. And this record certainly has its moments of profundity and depth, but it's also light and funny and full of energy. Now let's talk about the cultural impact and legacy of Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard. Tunnel is definitely the biggest moment we've had from Lana since NFR. As we all know, Lana is a moody character who is one moment devoted to promoting a project and then can drop it very well in the next breath. You never really know what you're going to get from her. Both Chemtrails and Blue Bannisters were kind of just put out there and left to their own devices. Tunnel was definitely a more concerted effort with an actual promotional marketing plan. Relative to Lana, of course, she's never going to do the Taylor Swift strategy put in place for the record to succeed. The first single was the title track, obviously an incredible choice, and I think is definitely the thesis statement of the album. She's going to jail for never doing a video for this song, though. It was begging for a visual, and this is the one part of the record cycle where I feel like Lana really let herself down with the visuals. We know she can serve a visual, but whether she can be bothered to execute one is another question. This song was well-received by critics, but didn't really make a splash, per se, probably because Lana just dropped it and said, enjoy, basically. Neil Krug did the artwork for Tunnel, and I think this shoot is completely beautiful. Lana's face card never declines. It also felt thematically coherent with 65 different cover options, including a bare-breasted one that she almost chose but thought the better of at the last minute. There were a few variations of the vinyl artworks, and I thought they were all really tasteful and beautiful. I loved the color palettes and the font choices, and the aesthetic vibe of this is definitely dreamier and darker than NFR, reflecting the more expansive subject matter. The second pre-release single to be heard was American Horror, and of course, this song was completely shocking. I don't think any of us expected it to be as experimental and audacious as it was. What's funny is that the first two singles from Tunnel really reflect the strategy used for Norman, and this scenario, Mariners is the beautiful, more straightforward ballad with Tunnel, and American Horror is the Venice Bitch equivalent, a daring and rogue single choice with elements that make it very unique and different from her other work. So Venice Bitch was a 10-minute song, and American Horror is two songs conjoined together. American Horror instantly receives critical acclaim. It's no wonder the song is up for song of the year. Again with Lana, sometimes it can be really frustrating to bemoan that she doesn't get recognized enough for her work when sometimes she does the bare minimum to promote it. Laura Snapes for The Guardian described this song specifically as it makes no sense and it's oddly brilliant, which is one of the most succinct descriptions of it that I've seen. It topped multiple year-end lists as the best song of 2023, Pitchfork Best New Track, We Been New. The third pre-release was The Grants. Not much to say about this. Uh, and the fourth and apparently final single was Candy Necklace, which had an interesting and according to Lana, very expensive music video to accompany it. She was mad that people didn't watch this, but you know, if you're putting out three singles and only then coming around to a video, people are going to lose interest. It's like a music video within a music video, lots of like meta elements, and it's very much giving damned old Hollywood starlet. The record itself, of course, received critical acclaim. Another Guardian review called it her most willfully inscrutable effort yet, which is a very apt description of its defiance to be categorized, though I have compared it to some of her other records throughout this video, it truly stands alone as one of the weirdest things she's ever done, and definitely stands apart from the other albums nominated for Album of the Year. It's wackier, weirder, and more adventurous. It's an unlikely candidate, a dark horse, if you will. Some critics, however, found the whiplash of all the different things going on on Tunnel to be a little bit alienating and difficult to parse. There's definitely a line to walk between style and substance, and some critics argued that it veered too much into style and not enough into substance. The record debuted at number three on the Hot 100, which was her biggest opening week since Honeymoon. This shocked me. It had 115,000 
thousand copies sold in the first week. Lana is never going to sell records like Taylor Swift, but these numbers for any artist are still impressive in the modern day. And Lana also sells physical units very well due to her vinyl, cassette, and CD variants. She truly is the kind of artist that makes you want to hold a copy of her work in your hands. As always with Lana, it's very difficult to place where this record is going to fall in her legacy as she's nearly always ahead of her time. And this record keeps revealing itself to me. So I think that this will become more clear as we go forward. The lazy promo for this record was kind of a letdown though. Even her summer shows didn't really have much tunnel actually in the show set list themselves. So yeah, that's kind of the hurdle that I think Lana always kind of falls at. And I think probably is what's going to prohibit her from getting more awards in the future, unless she really decides to participate in the bargaining and the campaigning for album of the year. But I think, you know, it wouldn't really be true to her as an artist to go out of her way to receive that. I have the sense that Lana would only like to be awarded completely based on merit and if people really like it versus trying to scheme her way into it. But I think that having a nomination and having the amount of nomination she has this year is long, long overdue. I still can't believe that Norman was snubbed the way that it was, especially given the quality of the competition that year, just truly baffling to me. But again, Lana is one of those artists where, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. And if you don't, then I honestly feel bad for you. Leave me a comment and let me know what you think is going to win album of the year. What do you think Tunnel's chances are? And do you think there are any other awards Lana's up for that she's a shoe in for or things you think that she maybe won't get? What do you think she deserves the most, I guess, is my main question to you. And make sure to tune in for more of my Grammy videos. There's a lot more coming for you this month. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.